Wholesale Hotline, where we cover everything to do with wholesale real estate. I'm Jamil Damji. I'm Brent Daniels. And I am Pace Morby. And together we cover the most important parts of wholesale real estate. Lead generation. Conversion of sellers into contracts. And dispositions. Guys, remember when you're watching this show, do us a favor and squad up in the comments. Make sure that you are liking and subscribing to the YouTube channels and in the Facebook group, Wholesale Hotline. Most important, we wanna know we're doing a great job for you and helping you build your business. So go give us a review on iTunes and or Spotify. So squad up and enjoy the show. We're all here. Here we go. Welcome to Wholesale Hotline number 114. We're going to be talking about mobile home parks, mobile homes, mobile everything. Today, you've done it all. You own a mobile home park. I own right? a couple, yeah. So we're going to get all of those questions. Guys, if you have ran into or running into um, mobile homes, that uh, either they are part of the park or they own the land themselves. We are here to answer your questions. Let me start with this real quick, all right? Because I think that this is really interesting, guys. Really amazing book here. It's called Go for No. It's tiny. You could read it in 30 minutes. Here's what it says. Statistically, only 5% of the population will be able to retire without assistance. 5%. Mm. Mm. 36% will have already died, 6% will continue working, and a staggering 53% will be dependent on friends, relatives, government, or charity for survival. And who do you think gets to be the lucky 5%? The people who failed most during their lifetimes. That's who. Wow. What do you think of that? I 100% love that. I've been thinking about what are the statistics of people in retirement, and I haven't been able to look it up. Mm -hmm. It's weird that you brought it up today. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, if you look at it, a lot of people are relying on either pensions or Social Security or just dividends that they get from their, um, from their stock portfolios to be able to live out the rest of their life, mm -hmm. you know, or they're, or they do a reverse mortgage right, and start getting paid off of that type of thing. But I mean, it's, it's absolutely insane. 5%. How is that possible in the, in the wealthiest country in the planet? Well, people aren't planning, right? You know, the facts are, is that we've got very, very few people that are making enough money week after week or month after month to put anything away in savings. And we keep having these black swan events in life. You know, mm -hmm. these the Great Recession happens, wiped out so many people. And look, I got wiped out in 2008, 2009. Yep. Yep. And it took every ounce of me, took every bit of me to be able to come back from that. Yep. So thank yeah, but God. Do you, think, do you think because of that, you're in the place you are now? This is talking about failing and yes. failing and failing and failing. And yes. part of that was probably failing, but it was probably something that... Uh, you didn't have enough experience. I didn't have enough experience understanding what could happen if all of a sudden the music stopped. Right. You know what I mean? Right. But now going into it, how does that change the way that you feel about things? How does it change about the th the companies that you're building and the and the assets that you're investing your money into? Well, I've not strayed from my course of action, right? Yeah. You and I and Pace, you know, my strategy has been for a long time to be very cash heavy. Mm -hmm. Now, and in a time of an, of high inflation, people are going to think I'm a crazy man mm -hmm. because I've got a whole lot of cash. I'm holding a lot just of cash. Burning it. I'm just burning away my cash. At the same time, uh -huh. guys, we are moving into what my belief is a forced recession, an engineered recession. Okay. I believe that the Fed is raising rates and they will continue to raise rates until they force a recession on the economy. Now, is this recession going to be completely devastating to the housing market? No. It like anything else, let's imagine the housing market is a room. Mm -hmm. Okay? And we are turning the thermostat down in the room. For us to imagine that the temperature won't decrease knowing we're turning the temperature down mm -hmm. is insane. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Fed is turning the temperature down. What does that mean? Rates are going to go up. If rates go up, what does that do to buyers? means that fewer of them can afford 
what we are trying to sell them. So fewer of them can buy, mm -hmm. which increases the demand, which will create some softening. So guys, just be, pre be prepared for it and know how in our business models, creative finance, wholesale, we can prosper and actually excel in times where the market is softening. Yes. I am praying for a recession. Right. I mean, we've we've crushed it. Like last year, we bought, I don't know, I'd say $20 million in real estate. This year already, we've bought five or $6 million in real estate all through creative finance. And that's while the market's been going up. Yep. Imagine when the market's going down, all the things that I can just pick up and pick up and pick up. Like today, we're negotiating on a 260-unit um, multifamily in Florida, seller finance, mm -hmm. $68 million purchase, 4.5% mm -hmm. interest rate on seller finance. Bro, you go and try and buy a multifamily deal right now, your interest rate's six over 6% 6 for a commercial loan like that. Imagine when we're in the 7%, the 8%, while other people are not able to buy, I'm going to be able to pick up a ton of stuff. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, in a down market, are you going to be able to wholesale? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You'll oh, destroy. Yeah. yeah. You'll destroy. I, I, I oh, oh, crushed yeah. wholesaling in the down market. I crush wholesaling when it's flat. I crush wholesaling on the way up. The beauty of wholesaling is we don't get caught with our pants down. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And if we don't get ca caught with our pants down, guess what? We're, we're still the only ones clothed enough to play the game. That's it. Yeah, that's there's a good phrase that says um, you don't know who's wearing a swimming short or swimming shorts until the tide goes out, right. right? You don't know who's naked. Well, and this this is what I really think: being naked in in my mind is not developing the skills that you need Agreed. in good times, even Agreed. times and bad times. The skills of effectively communicating, the skills of going out and sourcing discounted real estate. That is a skill. If you're just coming in and you crush it and you make big profits and then all of a sudden you start hiring people and you start building these big companies before you really understand and have the skills to be able to do that, those are, that's when you get caught, in my opinion. That's why I always encourage anybody, I don't care if you have a million dollars in your bank account, go and talk to a thousand people about real estate. Seriously, just go ask a thousand people if they would consider an offer on their property before you hire anybody. Just build up that skill that of, of communicating and having good conversations about property. Who are, you did it. Who are the you people? You did it. Who are the I did it. Oh, yeah, 100%. Who are the people that are going to be hurt in a recession that, like you said, it's an engineered recession? Who's going to be hurt in real estate? So Specifically to real estate. Not people that aren't taking action, but people that are in real estate. Specifically to real estate are the people who come in, buy at a really high rate, or mm -hmm. way overpaid for their property and then have to sell. Okay. Those are typically the people that that get hurt because look, I don't think we're heading for anything greater than greater than possibly a 5% softening, right. okay? And we're still appreciating so high that I don't even know if it does a lot to pr to pricing. You know, it, there's I think it just tapers off. It a tapers bit. off. I you know, it's like we're going to it's it is a tapering it, it it's going to be a pressure in the different direction from where the pressure is right now which is what we need guys things are madness out there right. we showed a house today and a buyer walked in and said this is my 61st 61st house i have been at this for a year i had to take a break mm. and now i'm back because interest rates have gone up so hopefully some of these buyers are 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 going to be not able to participate in this market. Secondly, this hasn't stopped. Interest rates going up, going up hasn't stopped. The 20% of the home buying activity right now of the private equity firms and the hedge funds. So I still don't know what what they do to the market and if and if they even allow enough inventory to hit the market mm -hmm. to create any problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, Aji says, Hey, Pace, do you buy wholesale properties in Fayetteville? Jamil and I were just in Fayetteville a couple of months ago. I just bought another subject to deal. You went to my subject to deal in Fayetteville. I now own five properties subject to in Fayetteville. I'm a big believer in the migration pattern to Fayetteville because of Amazon and a couple of other places or other companies like Toyota building factories out there in Fayetteville. So I'm, I'm long on Fayetteville. However, I am not fixing and flipping outside of the state. I do fix and flip in Arizona, probably about 40 properties a year. Um, what I would do is I would find a sub two student, which we have, I think we have about 25 sub two students in Fayetteville and sell 
a deal to them in Fayetteville. I'm not a good buyer for you in Fayetteville. I would just turn around and wholesale it and make a rip off of it. But you can find somebody in the comments to help you out. This is a this is a great question right here. You got any buyers in Fayetteville? Sure. Yeah. There's some there's some Astro peeps in the comments. I would love to help you out as well. Um, here we go. Affordable housing and Section Eight. Anything government related, especially when the government's printing money to keep people, like you said, fifty. What was it? Fifty five percent of people will be dependent on friends, family, et cetera, yep. or some other source of whatever. Yep. So if you're looking at affordable housing, particularly mobile homes and mobile home parks you will win in a recession yes yes because let's say that there's deflated um uh rentals right let's say rentals maybe take a little bit of a hit because people are going out of class a and class b and going into class c do you think people are leaving mobile home parks or mobile homes or any of that kind of stuff to go find something else i don't think that we have a huge affordability switch up Right. I don't think that's going to happen at all. I think mobile home parks, mobile homes in general, they're an asset class right now, which is the most accessible asset class that's available. And I don't think that's going to change. I think actually it's going to get worse. I think it's going to get worse still, even with interest rates going where they are, even with the recession. Guys, first and foremost, let's just back it up for a moment. A recession doesn't mean a housing crash. No. A recession does not mean a housing crash. In fact, there have been recessions where housing has gone up. When we talk about a recession, we talk about a contraction in economic activity. Okay, overall, overall. So just because we have an economic recession doesn't mean we have a housing crash. So I need you to separate that in your head because a lot of us are bringing in our previous example of living through the last recession and we think about oh housing crash but mm -hmm. not mutually exclusive remember that yeah not this time not this time not this time um yeah it's it's really interesting you know as soon as interest rates start going up people are like oh my gosh what's happening you know it's gone up and people's payments changed by 500 dollars. you know what i mean and that affects a lot of people but it doesn't affect our cash buyers. Our cash buyers are going bananas right now. 100%. Like they're going crazy. Not only that, but the the hedge funds? They still roof I mean stock? You mess with them at all? No. Oh my gosh, bro. They're they're going crazy. We just locked up one on 36th Street and uh Cactus, right? 85032. Great great area. Right? Sold it to 127,000. $127,000 spread on that. Wow. They were at retail. Wow. Where, where's my cut? Needs work. Where's my cut? <laughs> Needs work. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm telling you, it's there's so many opportunities. There, the the cash buyers have been pounding on our doors to bring more deals. For real. I, I mean, that's just what's going on. That's real life right now. Now, the thing that I'm, I'm wondering about is as interest rates go higher, do these hedge funds... Do, do they keep raising money? Do they no, keep maybe growing? They, that, maybe that's what they do. Maybe they continue to grow. Maybe they continue to grow and they continue to buy up assets. Guys, if we're in for what I think we're in for, mm -hmm. okay, go back to my IG 18 months ago. I've been talking about this. I believe that we are moving away from home, from the regular family owning homes to corporations owning all the homes and Americans just renting. Mm. We are going there. We are heading there. And that's the play they've been betting on. That's the play they've been making. Why would they stop? Let me tell you this. Have we not done the one thing to the average home buyer that the private equity firms and the massive, massive institutional buyers want, which was tie the home buyer's hands by raising rates? Mm -hmm. If we further mm -hmm. incapacitate the average American from being able to purchase by lowering rates mm -hmm. or raising rates, which we need to do anyways, but that still doesn't affect the secondary home buyer. Have we not just made it even easier for them to do what they're planning to do in the first place? Is there enough money for them? You think they can raise that much? Bro. I mean, it's like tr tr trillions, like hundreds of trillions in real estate, right? They would have lot. to print a lot of money. I mean, look, if they own markets, if specific they, markets if they, they own, can take over they can take market. over specific yep. markets yep. and they can take over or they could take over substantial enough percentages of specific markets to yep. have an effect on pricing so that they can create 
price threshold. Let's give Mike a little bell ring. Come on. Come on. Oh, yeah. Good job, Mike. Good job. Also, guys, uh, uh, an Astro student, Paula, just got her first deal, and Come she just on, got Paula. her check today. Come Where is she? And then Paula Lujan, she's up there. And then also, guys, wait, keep that bell, mofo. So you know John Galan. Yeah. You know John Galan. He's yeah. a friend of Wholesale Hotline. Yeah. So he is a an accountant, okay. and he started astro flipping. And when he started astro flipping, he got so obsessed with real estate that he said, "I can't be an accountant anymore. I hate my job. Right. I hate my job. I hate what I'm doing. Yep. I'm waiting though until April fifteenth to quit my job because I have to do right by the people I'm working with and mm -hmm. finish these tax returns, and then I'm bouncing. I really want to get my first deal." before I quit my job. If I have to quit my job before I get my first deal, I'll do it, but I really want to get my first deal. Yeah. But as a threshold to get my first deal, I'm not going to shave my face until I get my first deal. John Galan got his first deal, EMD in, paper signed, everything done, April 15th. No, the drop down day. Dude, yeah, April 15th. Come on. Come on. Now we got to talk about shaving his face. Yeah. Can we shave it? Absolutely. Wholesale Hotline next week. We're going to actually <laughs> shave his face on stage Don't in, let me in, shave in, in Las Vegas. There you go. You want to come out and shave it for him? It, this weekend? Yes. Nah, I'm in Disneyland. Brent doesn't want to shave you, but Pace and I got yeah. it. Yeah. That's awesome. My, my wife makes a comment about Orange Monster yesterday, and now all I'm getting is my, on my Instagram is Orange Monster, Orange Monster. You shouldn't drink Orange Monster. You know what? Kiss my ass. Your mom sends them to me. I'm going to drink them. It's, it's disrespectful to not accept a gift. So go. tell your talk to your mom first before you come at me. Okay. Well, and they, on the subject of your moms. Yeah. Let's talk about mobile homes. Yeah. Let's talk about where your mom lives, dog. <laughs> Just playing. Oh, my God. Um, so here's the number one question regarding mobile homes. Yes. Number one question. How do I comp a mobile home? Yep. First thing you have to know, and Jamil's the comping master, so let's lead, let's lead into this. Let you first thing you have to know is the difference between a mobile home that owns the land, that's it, and a mobile home that does not own the land. This is the trickiest part about it: is that people send me mobile homes like, "Pace, I got this mobile home under contract for seventeen thousand dollars." I'm like, "It's not a mobile home; it's a vehicle with a VIN number, and it doesn't own anything, and it's going to cost me more money to transport it than what it's actually worth." Right. Correct. Right. Correct. Do you even do you even mess with those? I know there's no. I specialize. I don't. Those. I don't mess with them. But you know what? Somebody sent me a message on Instagram the other day and said, "Jamil, I'm disappointed because there's always an opportunity to make money." And yes, sure. there is. Sure. So when you find out how to make money with mobile homes that aren't owned, then come and tell everybody in wholesale hotline because I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> but you can figure it out and figure out how to make money on it, and we'll help you. Well, listen. When you're looking at a mobile home it's either the park or it's the actual individual like does an individual own the land or does the park own it now if the park owns it that's a whole different discussion and that's a whole different conversation with the owner of the park it, it pace in your experience how is are these corporate owned typically the big parks is it individual owned is there a lot of like mom and pops to go after for these bigger parks or is it mostly like you're fighting against you know hedge fund type of ten, so 10 years ago it was primarily mom and pop yeah and what's happened is blackrock and other companies like blackrock have realized holy crap these have strong returns, returns yeah and very little turnover right people that move into mobile homes will typically stay there 20 30 years like i'm done a yeah. lot of veterans, a lot of retired people, like they're not interested in moving around a lot. So what happened in the last 10 years is BlackRock, when I was doing, when I was building mobile home parks with Jesse and mm -hmm. Evo, we were building 50 units and we were trying to get one freaking manufactured home built. And the manufacturer says BlackRock bought out our entire manufacturing line for the no. next, oh yeah, for the next five years. So wait until we get our other plant up and going before you can make an order. Yeah. Literally, BlackRock's like, whatever you're building for the next five years, we're buying all of it. 
More evidence. Yeah. More evidence. Yeah. That was four, three, four years ago. Yeah. And so um, it's now more and more. Anything that's usually 200 doors or more yeah. is more corporate owned. Anything 200 doors or less is mom, mom and pop. So if we're pulling lists, let's mm -hmm. say we're going to go after these parks. We're going to look for individual owners. You're going right? to look for individual owners. Yep. And Length of ownership. Length of ownership is amazing. So the people that we're typically buying from are in their 60s, 70s. Right. They've owned them for a long time. I've got one in Pueblo, Colorado right now that we're looking at, seller finance. The guy's like, look, I bought this thing for $4 million. I'll sell it to you for $15 million. You give me a little bit of money down, I'll let you seller finance the whole entire thing. Mm -hmm. He made his entire living on one mobile, mobile home, home park. park. Yep. And he's like, I'm done. Like yep. It's all the way paid off. If I can just get a, a nice little cash flow from me. So um, length of ownership, I would say 10 plus years because yep. you want to work with tired landlords, tired yep. landlords. And plus by that time, they're very stabilized. They've worked yep. with these people. They know these people. They're probably sick of these, the people that live there. Right. right. And they're ready to cash out. There are cities that dominate in this okay. um, area. And usually they're people, uh, the people that are moving into mobile home parks are elderly, right? right. Arthritis. COPD, mm -hmm. right? Anybody knows what COPD is? It's a breathing issue mm -hmm. where if there's any um, liquid or humidity in the air, people have a hard time breathing. And so what do they do? They move to affordable desert. areas, the desert. Yeah. So Palm Springs, Yuma, Arizona, Mesa, Apache Junction. There are so many places that are dry, like Texas. There's certain parts of West Texas that are really, really dry, not humid. Yep. Um, so people are going to live there for forever. So they're strong, strong, strong. Now, I would say you guys don't want to mess around with anything. This depend. This is different because you guys, half the people here want to wholesale, yeah. and I want to own all the mobile home parks. Sure. Right? I don't want to wholesale sure. mobile home parks. The last mobile home park I bought, I paid a TTP student thirty thousand yep. bucks that assigned it to me. Yep. So, I'm happy for wholesalers to wholesale deals to me. You want to make sure you stay at two hundred doors or less when was you're pulling. It, it was not Katie. No, no. Um, 200 doors or less when you're pulling a list. Otherwise, you're going to be competing with the hedge funds and the people that come in and just go, we don't care units? what. 200 or less. 200 doors or less. So the hedge funds or institutional buyers, they won't buy anything that's 200? They won't because it's hard, it's hard to manage, right? That's the challenge. Why do they want to go? And same thing, we, we had a multifamily deal I was looking at today. I sent it over to a buyer and they go, it's a great deal. And it was 210 units. And they go, we don't touch anything less than 250. And I'm like, it's 40 units off. Like, it doesn't pencil. Like, we know what pencils and yeah. what doesn't. So for manufactured home parks, mobile home parks, um, stay under 200 doors or less, and you're going to be able to communicate directly with the owner. And what it is, is a lot of these owners from 20, 30 years ago are still not sophisticated. They're not using software. Right. They're literally picking up the cash oh, yeah. deal. There is so much opportunity in there. And they go, yeah. I haven't raised the rents in nine years. I know I should, but I really, really love these people. So mm -hmm. there are um, undervalued rents mm -hmm. with people that are tired of owning these properties. Yeah. And the books must be terrible. A mess. So my, they can't my book, even prove, they can't no. prove their value. No, and half the time they're receiving cash. So like the, I bought a 35 unit in Yuma, Arizona and the um, P&L and all the numbers were given to me on scratch paper basically in a pencil. Yeah. And I was like, I can't verify any of this. Yeah. So we, uh, Bobby and I, Bobby and I went down to Yuma and I spent a whole day knocking on the doors and talking to the tenants. What are yeah. you paying? How's it going? Are you happy here? Because the landlord had no proof. No record. He had owned the property yeah. for 20 years and he's just living on the cash. And was he living there too? No, he lived in California. He lived in California. And the th here's the thing is like most of these owners, they just need one of these parks to literally survive their whole life. Right. Their take homes twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month on one freaking park. Let me ask you about these parks. Is the park just the land or do people buy the land and then put the actual mobile homes on it and rent out the whole thing? It you depends, know what I mean? It depends on the strategy. Because I bought one that's just it was just like you were the saying, dirt. like literally I had to go to the DMV yeah, yeah. and get the transfer and they gave us like a couple grand. It was a little deal, but I was just experimenting and um, they didn't own the land, but they had to bring in their own mobile home. Yeah, yeah. Right. So there's, there's really two different types of mobile home parks. Yeah. There's two the ones there's... that provide the, the, the actual structure and the ones that you have to bring your own. So my biggest park is one that is 37 units now because we've added a couple of units. That's my biggest park so far. I have 80 doors in mobile home parks okay. combined. And my 37 units, um, the way it's structured now is I own half of them and I wish I did not. Huh. I wish I did not. 
Mm -hmm. um, because what happens is I get calls on those. Mm -hmm. Hey, will you fix my shit? Hey, there's a bullet hole in my mobile home. Mm -hmm. Well, who put the bullet hole? Well, my, you know, we got in an argument and we are shooting the gun. I'll say, I have to go and fix that. So for me, what I've been doing for the last year is I've been selling my mobile homes to the tenants sure. because then it increases my rent. And here's right. what ultimately happens. They leave. They, they leave. leave. I had two of them leave last year after they bought the mobile home. Mm -hmm. And so when, as they're leaving, I go, I'll buy that from you for five grand. They bought it for 20. Yeah. So for me, it's, I don't want to own any of the, the mobile homes. That's the key. You don't want to own any of the mobile homes if you're going to keep it. So, but there's other people that are like, I want to control it. Like these big mobile home parks that are 300, 400 units, the Black Rocks of the world, they don't want their tenants to own any of those. They yep. want to start owning all of them. Got it. Right? Yep. They wouldn't want to control it. So it's two completely different worlds. It's the Mon Pa world. It's kind of like, would you ever see a big company touch a duplex, like a Black Rock? Oh, heck no. No, they're not going to waste their time. Yeah. So they won't waste their time with mobile home parks that are 200 or less. And then in that world, there's about 50 different directions you can go. You can be the guy that owns all the pro the units if you want, because now you have more rent. Or you can say, I don't want to deal with this at all. I want to have zero calls, zero maintenance whatsoever, other than landscape. And your life is easy, but mm -hmm. your rents are now deflated. Yeah. What, do you, what do you want? What's your flavor? Yep. For me, I want no maintenance. Yep. So that's the parks are one whole avenue. Then looking at the actual structures themselves, I know that you've taught me some things about mobile mobile homes I never knew about a them needing to be attached. Yeah, fixed. So there's a whole there in order for a person, and let's just say somebody is out there right now making calls on land, and they get somebody who says, you know what, I got this chunk of land, I don't want it, I don't want it anymore. You can have it, or give me five hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And they talk to somebody and they say, I've got this 2,000 square foot mobile home. Uh, I don't own the land and I only want $500 for it. Yeah. So someone's like, wow, for a thousand bucks, I could possibly take this mobile home, mm -hmm. put it on this acre of land out in the middle of nowhere and go live there. Mm -hmm. How do I do it? Uh, the way you do it is you have to get, it, it has to be zoned properly, right? Okay. To have a, have a structure on it, sure. a residence. Second thing you have to do is you have to get a permit. And whatever mobile home you buy, it doesn't matter whether it's $1,000 or not, you need to tack on a $15,000 amount mm. because you have to hire a wide load with a, a, a courier on the front and the back. Transport. You guys have all seen them. You've seen the transport companies. Mm -hmm. Then you have to have a crane that pulls this bad boy off, and then you have to have somebody who installs it on post and pier. All of this costs about $15,000. It used to be ten dollars now it's 15, right? With the inflation costs. Then you have to pay about $2,800 to affix that property to the land for it to no longer be a, a, a vehicle. And it now is um, affixed to the land. And it is now called real estate. Yeah. Now you could effectively go and sell that to somebody for yeah. 80 grand or a lot more. Yeah. Or a lot more. If you so, I did a deal um, in Mesa, Arizona. I bought it from a, a wholesale hotline um, listener. I bought a piece of land in Mesa, Arizona for $19,000. I put a mobile home on it for uh, $40,000. Mm -hmm. So I'm all into it about 60, 65. And the ARV on it was about 120. Okay, so I could have sold that retail for 120. I, you know, after commissions, closing costs, et cetera, I would have walked away with what, $40,000 net, maybe $50,000 net. Okay, but I sold it for two eighty nine on seller finance at eight point nine percent interest. Mm. So I get a check every single month for seventeen hundred dollars a month from that buyer, and there's a there's a thousand different things you can do because it's affordable freaking living. There are so many buyers for land and mobile home uh, units, like Jamil is talking about. People that are literally like in Apache Junction. There are so many vacant lots that there's a couple of buyers out there that that's all they're doing. They're driving up and down all day long, looking for lots, looking for lots, looking for lots. They know how much freaking money there, there is in just doing what you said. Buy the piece of land, throw a used mobile home unit on it. A used one. Yeah. A used mobile home. <laughs> and have somebody deliver it, install it, affix it to the land. It's now called real estate. It's crazy. And you can go get a mortgage against that. 
Yeah, you can go get a mortgage against it. Yeah, you could sell it. You could do a seller finance. You could do an owner finance. You could you could wrap a brand. You could write your own new mortgage mm -hmm. on it. Yeah. What I do actually the story of this deal. Not that anybody wants to hear the whole entire story, but it was a a, a referral came from Rylas Dana. Shout out Rylas Dana. What up, Rylas? Probate attorney. Uh, shout out Rylas Dana. I got four leads from him last week. We're getting another one under contract from him. Uh, right on Earl. I thought about you when I went to the buy appointment this Good morning. Good street name. Nice. Jamil lives on Earl Street here in Phoenix, Arizona. Anybody wants to what's drive? What's the address? Oh, what's your address again? <laughs> and what's your cell phone number? Okay, so I get a referral from Rylas Dana, <laughs> and I go to the property. It's uh, Rylas Dana is a probate attorney, so it was somebody who had passed away, and her sister inherited the property. So I meet her sister at the property. I buy the deal, and the sister, um, I give her one hundred and twenty thousand dollars for the property. I turn around, Jamil doesn't know the whole story, but I turn around, I wholesaled it to Jamil for 30,000. Jamil turned around and wholesaled the deal for 180. So he made 30, I made 30. This is uh, two years ago. You guys made 30, I made 30. It was a great deal. But the best part of the deal is that the way I got this deal under contract is I had this piece of dirt out in Mesa, Arizona, okay? That I just bought for like 19 grand. I was like, ah, I'll put a mobile home on it and I'll sell it and I'll do something with it. Mm -hmm. So this lady goes, I've always wanted to be the owner of a property, but this house that I just inherited from my sister is too small. So I need to sell this and I need to upgrade into a three bed, two bath house in Mesa, Arizona. I was like, for 110, you, lady, you're dreaming. Mm -hmm. But you could use this money as a down payment. She's like, I have bad credit. I have bet this, but we have good income. We've been renting for 16 years. I go, okay, why don't you give me the $120,000 as a down payment? Mm -hmm. And I'll sell or finance this thing to you. So here's what I did. I got the $19,000 um, dirt. I got the $40,000 unit. Mm -hmm. I'm into the thing, 60,000 bucks. I receive $120,000 as a down payment. So 60 grand up front. And she still owes me $179,000 at 8.9% interest. Mm -hmm. I get that payment every single month. She's paying you. And I made 30 grand on the wholesale to yeah. you. You made 30 grand on the wholesale. Your company did. Yeah. And I then went and made $179,000 on top of all that at 8.9% interest. She's been paying for two years solid. Wow. There's magic in mobile homes. Magic in mobile homes and dirt and, and, and land. And you guys do a lot more land than I do, especially you right now. You just did a land deal today. I did. What, what are you doing? A uh, little 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 loop de loop. -de -loop. <laughs> I picked up a little lot over in central Phoenix. I wanted to build an Airbnb there, but... You know, I'm a wholesaler. Yeah. So I got a call. Somebody said, "Want to make fifteen thousand bucks?" I you was like, me, "Bro, <sighs> we have the same same brain." I'm telling you, I'm just like, lizards. Yeah, I'll get it. Yeah, lizards. Get it. yeah. <laughs> fifteen thousand. Yeah. <laughs> I can't help it. I can't help it. Yeah. I mean, I wholesale that deal to you. I wholesale all the time. <laughs> I wholesale all the time. I just love talking about what you can do with this I stuff. I built the beautiful Airbnb there. And Why didn't you, by the way? Because I'm a wholesaler. Yeah. And mm. I can't. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's break, let, let's break this down for a second because I think this is important. Because oh, I, I, I feel the same way. Yes. But you built a company based on wholesaling real estate. Yes. Right? Yes. Not a, not a rental portfolio company, right? Not a fix and flip company, a wholesaling company. Then you franchise that and you've got them all over the place. Mm -hmm. 115 the net, the net, markets. The net value of what you own in that company is huge. Millions and millions and millions and millions. Mm -hmm. If you were like, you know what, guys, I need to take a sabbatical for like five years. It would still pay you. You're yes, still yes, owner yes. in this thing, Always. right? Yes. You know what I mean? And it's it's really interesting when we look at, you know, we read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. We read, read uh, Think and Grow Rich. We go down the rabbit hole of building a really big portfolio. And then we get into the business. We start finding these deals. We start making some money. We start replacing our, our other income or other job. We get into this full time. We start building a business. And then all of a sudden we get distracted. Get distracted by all these other things, right? Yeah. How did you, get... when you were growing this up, not get distracted? Why didn't you become a home builder? I did. Right. My first go around. That's what tanked me. That's what kicked me right square in the nuts. All right. What? Why not? Why not uh, just uh, be a fix and flipper? Why not just go and uh, own a bunch of apartments? Brother, I, I, I am fixing and flipping, but doing it as diligently and as and as. Thoughtfully as possible. Efficient. Right. Efficiently as possible. Non-time consuming. 
Correct. You have the right systems and processes set up that you don't have to mess around with. It. Correct. My wholesale business is what my lifeblood is because, of course, that's the trading always going to be if happening. You disappeared. Yes. With your ownership. Yeah. Could you net over a million dollars a year from your easy? Easy. You know, you have to, and, and Pace and I were just talking about this. You have to own $27 million free and clear to earn a million dollars passively in real estate. So my business to, has done that for me. Of course. Yes. And you did that in how many years? Six. Right. How, how long would it take you to get $27 million worth of real estate free and clear? Oh, free and clear. That's, yes. a, that's a long time. Right. Yeah, I was like, I was like, I bought twenty. So what do you want to I bought twenty million last year. Build your business. Build your business first, build and then business. now you could go and you could you could taste whatever you want. Well, I'm gonna. I I have every intention of taking an exit from right. that company at some point. Right. That exit is going to be my, you know. You you're my making you're making a really strong point because what people need to stay on focus mm -hmm. the same way we all started and a lot of people in here. Yep. Is make money. That's it. You make money now. What's mm -hmm. the goal of the business? My dad taught me this as a young man and it stuck with me. I don't know why this simple thing stuck with me, but he says, here's the goal of the business to make money today mm -hmm. and in the future, right? not just in the future. Okay. So mm -hmm. when you're just starting out, you need to make money today. You need to get wholesale deals. You need to, it doesn't matter what it is. Assigning um, cash deals, assigning sub two, novations, doesn't matter. You can assign anything right. anywhere in the United States. Okay. Right. Um, make money now. The second thing that you need to do is you need to compound and multiply that money. Mm -hmm. And then third thing is manage it so you never lose it. Right. And then you can start doing some pretty dope shit like charitable contributions and changing people's lives and all of that kind of stuff. Do not get deviated from the path. The path, the first step of this path is to make money. Yeah. And even, even my students, they come in, they go, man, I just got a sub two deal. What should I do? Assign it. Right. Make money today, assign it. You you will be, now that you understand creative finance, you can do this a thousand more times in the future. Mm -hmm. They get a lot of cash deals. They're like, hey, should I burr this? No, get money in your pocket today. Yep. Wholesale, wholesale, wholesale. You can wholesale anything. So make money today. Ugly houses, big checks. Ugly houses, big checks. That's how you do it. And then you break your brain. You get that over $50,000 deal that wires into your account when you usually have $58 in your account. Now you have $50,058 in your account and your brain melts. It totally, it's like you're not the same person anymore. It's crazy. Big time. It's crazy when you see $50,000 worth of value that you provided the marketplace come back to you in the form of a receipt. And that receipt mm -hmm. is that wire that sends into your bank account. Like, that's it. And listen, we find what we're looking for. Without a doubt, I, there's not a single person on here that couldn't do a, a $50,000 deal plus. If you're looking for it, you will find it. It's just going through. It's if just you're going looking through. for it's failure, through. guess what you're doing too. If you're yep. expecting defeat, if you're expecting it to be just absolutely not for you, guess what it isn't? For you. Right. What, what is the, what is you the prove difference? Prove yourself right all the time. What is the difference legitimately where... A Brent Daniels mm -hmm. could be dropped anywhere in the country yeah. with just the shirt and, yep. and, and on your back, yep. which I don't know if that's ever been off your back. It's that's not. the thing. This is actually a tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this tattoo, yeah. you get dropped off anywhere in the country and with <laughs> without even a doubt, you just go out and you go, go, go get a deal within 12 to 24 hours. Not yes. even a problem. Yeah. What is the difference between you and somebody that's been in the business for six months that still hasn't gotten a deal done? Confidence. Seriously, it's all confidence. And I did not have confidence until I put in the reps. I did not have confidence the first time I went out all sweaty and knocked on doors because I was totally broke. I couldn't even open up a checking account, guys. They wouldn't give me a checking account. That's how terrible my credit was, right? I had owed so much money on credit cards and cars and all this consumer debt that it was, I couldn't open, I had to get something, I had to send money into some online company and they sent me a debit card. And that's how I, and I'm out there knocking on doors, scared as shit, but I knew if I just found that one opportunity of somebody that wanted to sell an ugly house, I'd be able to make some income. And that's how it started. 
And then it just kept going and going and going and going. And I did my first million dollars just writing on notes and putting them in a little binder. And I would just be obsessed. I would wake up and think of what deals could I sign up today? So what could I sign up today? I go to this appointment on Saturday. Right. Okay. And it's a lady. She's probably 81, 82. And it's a referral from a probate attorney. And I go to the house. It is, it's as bad as you've ever seen. Sure. And it's been cleaned out. Oh. So I'm talking to her and I go, so what made you want to sell? What's going on? And she's like, I've been trying to sell for a couple of years, but I'm hard of hearing. And so it's people get frustrated with me on the on phone. On the phone. Yeah. They get frustrated yeah. when they're on the phone. A lot of my students heard me take this call. So I call her. I did a 13 hour live on Friday. And she this I call her at the beginning. She calls me seven hours later. A lot of people heard the call and I set the appointment for the following day. Yeah. And I had to slow down my speech, talk to her. Um, you know, on her level, say only words I knew she could understand, mm -hmm. things that she, I knew she was expecting me to say. Set the appointment. I go to talk to her. As I'm leaving the appointment, I'm I'm on this road. And I'm like, Jamil and I drive on this road for the TV show. There's a house that we're doing like right here. It is amazing how many houses we pass on a daily basis that there's somebody inside that house mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. desperately wishing we would freaking help them. Yep. And so she goes... Nobody was patient enough to stay on the phone with me longer than three minutes right. to buy this house. Right. And I'm like, we're driving down all these roads. It's on Earl on 48th and Earl, somewhere around there. And I'm sitting here going, not 48th, 32nd and yeah. Earl. Okay. Like right in that area. Street Ave. Street. Ooh. Oh, it's a great deal. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm turning it into an Airbnb. Yeah. You want to be a partner on it? Yes. Wholesale, wholesale a deal and bring that money over and we'll partner on the deal. We'll get you oh, some, wait, we'll, get, we'll get you some did, depreciation. Just bring Dude, me the money. I just signed because the dirt I had yeah. was at exactly where you are and 31st. Really? Yeah. And you're just that's buying a killer, one at, that's on, a killer area. At 32nd. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, mine's a red, a little mine's a red, right red bricker. Little cute little red bricker. Brick. So I just, I, I I'm driving okay. through these neighborhoods mm -hmm. and I'm realizing like some of the things that you say over and over and over. How, what percentage of people get their first deal from driving for deals? 80%. 80%. 80%. And yep. I then I'm driving up and down this road and I'm seeing so many people with overgrown weeds. And I'm like, how is it that we're shouting from the rooftops that this is the greatest opportunity in the mm -hmm. whole entire freaking world and people aren't picking up these houses, picking up the damn phone and yep. talking to people? Yep. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you you had mentioned the the gal that you talked to that nobody would stay on for three minutes. That's the exact reason why if you make the calls yourself, it's one out of 200 people you talk to, you get a deal versus if you hire VA, it's one out of 800. Yeah, I believe that because yep. they're going through and looking at it from a numeric or a, yeah. a checking box standpoint Yep. versus you are like being patient, waiting for your, you know, the area, right. you know, the address, you know, what's going on. You really like sink your teeth into it because you know, this is going to be a great opportunity where somebody that's, you know, wherever else, maybe not, maybe doesn't have the patience or maybe is worried that they're going to like get a call recording and somebody's going to be mad that they're on the phone for too long with them. And then they bounce. Well, I'm I, telling I, feel, you, I feel like when land, you start out land is one of those things that, you know, I, I reach out to Jeremy on your team for yeah. a long time. Yep. Um, Jeremy sold a handful of deals for me. I bought a deal in Sholo for a thousand dollars and Jeremy sold it for us yeah. for like 16 grand. Yeah. It was landlocked. I'm like, what the hell is this person even going to do with it? They go. So this is two years ago. They go and buy the neighbor next door. Uh -huh. And now that $16,000 lot's worth like 400 grand because sure. it's like right on a golf course. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. so Jamil, I got a question. Yeah. I'm, I want to go out and I want to drive for deals looking for land. Okay. Mm. Let's say I'm in South Phoenix because I know you're looking for deals in South Phoenix, right? What is, what should I be looking for? Like, um, number one, I have, I've asked you this question legitimately because I don't know. I'm going through the town and I'm like, why are all these corners mm -hmm. of cross streets mm -hmm. naked? Mm -hmm. Like these ones are built out, but that one's naked. Why is that one naked? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's waiting for zoning. Maybe it's waiting for whatever. Are there specific types of lots I should be targeting and specific types of lots I should stay away from that you're seeing people have a hard time dispoing? Great question. So the, anything right now that's in residential areas, so even the ones on the corner, typically the one that you're, you're ones you're talking about, and I know exactly what you're talking about, there's usually a stop sign there. Mm -hmm. So the reason why those are hard corners is because there's accidents that happen on that corner. So that's always a corner yeah. that's a little bit yeah. less 
desirable, desirable mm-hmm. for a builder to come on and want to do. But right now, in a market like we have right now, yeah. that'll still sell. The land that's difficult that I've been seeing people are having a hard time with is that stuff that's heavy industrial Mm -hmm. on really specialized, like there's a junkyard over here. There's, you know, um, a nail salon supply warehouse over here and uh, a mortuary over here. Like, you know, you got a little piece right there. That's typically harder to sell mm. because you got to find a specialized mm. buyer. That that land will sell, but typically will sell on a commercial website. So when guys go out and they try and lead gen yep. in these really heavily industrialized areas, it can be a little dicey. So they should go on like loopnet.com or whatever and talk to maybe a commercial broker on those types of things. Talk to a commercial broker, but normally what's happened is those people have already talked to a commercial yeah. broker and the commercial broker gave them a number that was real mm-hmm. and they said, no, no, I'm not living in reality. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so what do you guys? How many how many likes do we have so far? Can thir- we get this up? Guys, we, we have need 31 this- likes, but we have between I- between yeah. Instagram and YouTube, we've got 700 plus people watching right now. Get oh, yeah. 31 likes. Come on, y'all. The heck. Let's get that up, guys. Freaking Brent got a tattoo for you guys. Like, it looks like a shirt, but it's a tattoo. Awesome. He did that for you. That's it. Another thing with those lots on the corner pace is um, gas stations and dry cleaners like really screw up the lots. Why and is that? They they like just environmental. Yeah, it's an environmental. Yeah, yeah. It, back in the day, there's there's a lot in Central Phoenix that the lots are just sitting there because they have to. You have to spend millions of dollars purifying the groundwater underneath them because they just dumped it straight in. Oh, my yep. word. I literally yep. Yep. learned something new right now. Yep. I did not even know. And that. gas stations, you know, they, they buried those big tanks. So you have to get all those out of there. Wow. You have to remediate them. There's a certain amount of time that they take. So sometimes it's some of that. If it's a commercial lot and it's just sitting there, you're like, what is going on here? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, what, so, Jamil, let's say tomorrow I want to find you a lot in South Phoenix because mm-hmm. I do. Well, tell me, coach me, man. Be my coach. Tell so me what I need to you do. Could very, How do I make you money? If mm. you wanted to do this virtually, you could go up and down the, you could use the batch driven app. You could use, you know, any Google street view, whatever it was, go up and down and look at all the zip codes in South Phoenix <laughs> and find vacant lots. Mm-hmm. Okay. They're, they're right there. You see the, is there a minimum size that you need to mess with? 5,000 square feet. Is okay. It? So South Phoenix guys, Google South Phoenix. I'm telling you, I've been watching him on set of the TV show in the RV and he's sitting there slinging lots and buy- you guys are actually building a couple things, mm-hmm. right? Some so affordable you- housing. This is, this is stuff that's not for profits. Right. It's more just to do it. Right. right. So it's per- for purpose, not for yeah. profit. Right. Yeah. So you I see him buying and closing on these things. Right. And I also see you wholesaling them and helping people find buyers for them. Right. Because people have a really hard time comping land. So if I find a 5,000 square foot lot in South Phoenix, guys, Google that 5,000 square feet. How do I, how do I run numbers on that? Is there something specific that a land builder or Mm. somebody is going to be looking at different than something has a building on it already? Humberto's question up. I think that's a great, you want to look at what's sold around it. So Typically, where you'll find new construction, there'll be some evidence of other new construction nearby. Mm -hmm. So, A, look for evidence of other new construction nearby. Mm -hmm. You go to South Phoenix and you look, you find a vacant lot. If you look to the east, to the west, to the north, you'll find evidence of new construction. There's There's constantly houses being built out there. Little houses, right? And they're like onesie twosies. So, if you see evidence of that kind of construction, of that kind of activity, that's what you're. I'm looking for. Secondly, if you're next to a big junkyard, if you're next to uh, like really, really crazy, crazy, crazy looking stuff, I don't want it. All right. I, I want it to be on a residential street that would be a nice place that you would want to live, right? In, in terms of like what a block looks like. Uh, and that's it. Those are the only stipulations. Guys, in the comments, uh, what, what, what do you would do? Raise a hand or something if you've ever had run into this question? Because I love this. this Where am I going to live if I sell you my house? Right. Well, a couple different things, and I'd love to hear um, how you guys respond to this. A couple different things. One is, what is a lead? A lead is somebody that has made the decision that they're going to sell their property. Yes, not, that's a not, lead. Not a house you saw on Zillow that you DM me and say, "Hey, I have a lead you might be interested." That in. that is a lead. That that is who you do your lead follow up. That's who you pre qualify. So one, they have to have already made the decision that they're going to sell their house. Remember, you can't convince people. 
You can't go, oh, I just thought you wanted to take advantage of the market. Oh, I thought you just wanted to get the highest price you could <laughs> before interest rates go too high and you lose a bunch of equity in your house. That doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. You're not going to be able. We're deal finders, not deal creators. And I'm not saying like creative. I'm not saying like that sense. I'm saying if they don't haven't made the decision that they're going to transfer title, if they or lack get rid of motivation. this property, right, right? Then they're not deals. Yeah. So the real answer to that is next, next. Yeah, you're I'm not, not gonna, sure how long have you thought about selling. You're not going to change people's yeah. decision making. Yeah. You imagine your purchase price on a house <clears throat> that would even make you any money, right? Could convince a husband and wife and a family to be like, "Damn, you know what? This guy offering me seventy percent of our value." Really got a scratch in our head. We really should sell. Great idea. <laughs> it's a great idea. We Guys, have no plans. That but, is not uh, what's going on here. We'll just, you know. And I think that's the problem is that when people are out there doing their lead generation, then they actually talk to somebody who says, yes, I'd be interested in an offer. And then they find out what they want. And it's like $200,000 over ARV. And then they get stuck. Mm -hmm. They get stuck with, oh, my God, I just, I just can't. I just can't leave this behind. I can't leave this person who said, yes, I want to sell behind. Right. But guys, that's what you do. You follow back up with them in three weeks, a month, two months. Their number will change as their motivation changes. Right now, they're interested in selling. They have no motivation. Look, look, the most important thing, it's not price. It is their timeline. What is their timeline? Mm -hmm. If yeah. you figure out how long they've been thinking about selling. Okay, great. How long have you been thinking about selling? You know, how long has this been on your mind? When, when, when do you feel is going to be the right time? You know, we usually close in 14 to 30 days. If I can get you your money for this property in 14 to 30 days, does that work for you? Well, no, this, that, right? Asking the questions back is going to really help to understand, have they made the decision to sell yet? Or is this a long-term follow-up? And long-term follow-up are people that have really rough houses, but maybe their timeline's just not set yet. Yeah. Or you could just get rid of it and catch them on the back, on, you know, when you come back around. Umberto, Umberto says, what is the best answer to a seller yeah. if they ask me, where am I going to live if I sell you my house? I have such a great answer for this mm -hmm. because I've lived this horrible existence. Uh, there was a moment in my business two years ago for about a month that Cody, my business partner, goes, we need to hire a full-time person, a full-time agent just to find houses for people we're under contract with. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. Then we can provide that as a service, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we then go out and try and find real estate agents that are looking for opportunities. We're like, we got all these people that need help finding houses. They're, we're under contract with them already. Mm -hmm. We had like nine houses under contract. And some of them, I have a couple of them still under contract today that mm -hmm. we have memorandums on it's from two years ago. Um, it didn't work. It didn't work. No. Here's what worked. No. I changed up the questions that our sales guys were asking. Okay. And the question was this. So let's say a seller says to you, well, I don't know. I don't know even know where I would live, even if you did buy my house. Okay. Well, let's imagine that you had to make a decision. Sure. What would, what's the first thing that would pop in your head? And they immediately give mm -hmm. an answer. Mm -hmm. Immediately give an mm -hmm. answer. Well, I guess I could ask my brother. I guess I could. all of a sudden these relationships come out of nowhere yeah. because my guys weren't asking the freaking question and digging to the pain. They were just like, oh, you want to sell and you need to find a house? We'll solve that problem for you instead of letting you solve that problem yourself. And we're going out to external elements mm -hmm. to try and solve their problem. They have the problem in their brain and yeah. already solved. Ask them the question, if you don't sell, what's going to happen? Right. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Qu the questions you you're ask. Not gonna, if you're not going to sell, if you don't sell, it, what, what's going to happen? And then just be quiet. Listen to them. Well, I'm not going to be able to keep it up. I'm not going to do this. Or they say, oh, I'll just stay here forever. It's cool. Okay, great. Congratulations. Do you have any other properties that you would consider an offer on? Maybe a piece of land or something that needs a lot of renovation. That's what we're really excited about. Check this out. And uh, to hit Jamil's point really hard, just set an appointment from a juicy lead right. that has been in my CRM for 649 days. The fortune is in the follow-up. That's right. Our, Get that locked up, Enzo. Our number is this. And I haven't checked on it for probably six months, but it was very, very true. 70% of our contracts come from 13 or more touches. 70% yeah. of our contracts come from 13 or more touches. How many touches do you think in 649 days? Uh, Probably for that, I'd say probably close to 50. Right. Like you're two years, right? Yeah. Two yeah. years. You're probably touching them twice a month is probably what you're doing. So 50 times. <laughs> um, and that's accurate because they might've said, Hey, I'm, I'm interested in selling. I know I want to, Oh, 
this happens all the time. People move to Phoenix for job opportunities. Then when they get to retirement age, they go, you know, I want to go back to Ohio. Or I want to go back to whatever. I want to go back to whatever. I'm not interested. I'm not ready yet, but I definitely know I'm going to move. Great. Do you mind if I follow up with you in 90 days? Mm -hmm. Great. Please do. Guys, you, you need to be planning your follow-up. Do you have a rule of thumb, Brent, that you follow in terms of follow-up? Yeah, I mean, if they're longer than 90 days, it's uh, twice a month. Twice, twice a month. month, we're touching base. And and listen, guys, 80%, if not 90% of follow-up is text messages. Yep. For real, because they don't answer. Yeah, you, they don't want to be bothered either. They're not there yet, right? right? They're not like, but you plant the seed, you plant the seed, you plant the seed, you know? How's it going? I hope everything. Oh. I, I hope everything's been great in your life. Just touching base about your property on twelve twelve Banana Street. Still excited to get you a solid cash offer on it. Let me know, go, bro. Could you go to Zillow? Right. Will you go to Zillow right now and okay. see if there's twelve twelve Banana Street any, <laughs> any, anywhere <laughs> anywhere in the United States? Can somebody Google go. that? 12, Best way to comp land. Best way to comp land. It's complicated. Yeah. First and foremost, guys, because there's zoning, there's density. Is that why we there's, call it comping? Because it's complicated. Yes. 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 There's location, all the things, all the things. Okay. So I'm going to remove 75% of what it's not. There you go. Okay. Yep. I'm going to remove, it's on a highway. I'm going to remove, it's 40 acres. I'm going to remove all this big craziness. We're talking about, you got a piece of land and you have houses nearby that have sold. Yeah. That's it. Okay. That's go after residential go lots, residential in lots neighborhoods. Okay? in neighborhoods. So we're removing all the other stuff. Yes. Right now, we're talking about guys. You need to listen to this seriously, seriously, seriously. All that rural stuff, all that commercial stuff. If you're just getting into this business, there's levels to this thing. Yep, go listen to them right now for real. Stay away from that stuff for yep. now and pay attention to the stuff that's in the neighborhoods. All you need to do is find something that has had somewhat of new construction. Maybe it was 2013, 15, or 20, whatever it is. There's 20, 12, 12 banana seeds. <laughs> Amazing. Is that real? Is that real? No. There's a, uh, there is a 12, 12 uh, banana street. I'm sorry, banana river drive in Florida. Oh banana my river gosh. Drive. Somebody All buy right. that immediately. <laughs> we, that's the new studio headquarters. That's it. We will finish. I'm gonna put it on no, this. no, no, no. I'm going to screw with everybody dropping off mail here. <laughs> change it all right what you do is you find what has sold the highest that's sold on, on that same size lot okay say it's a six thousand seven thousand so very close to that size lot see the highest that's sold and then get it under contract that's somewhere around 10 to 15 percent of that value guys we're going to be doing a land Ooh. we're going to be doing a land show 90 right. minutes on land we're going to really break this down um, my suggestion is if you run across some land, it doesn't matter in the country, if it's in a major market, reach out to Keegley, Keegley.com. You can go to Keegley.com, just like it sounds, find the rep that's in your area or DM, uh, probably not, that might be too much. Yeah. Just, yeah. Get, get so with us on the website yeah. and we'll, and we'll get in touch with you. And then find somebody in that market that can comp it for you and give you a buy price. If you're just getting new at this, Yep. if not, just try to get it at, um, uh, yeah, I mean, 10, 10 to 15 percent of what a brand new house would sell for yep. on that lot. And would you go? Are you are you seeing that people are? What can you sell that at? What could your your guys kind of move that at? I mean, 20 percent, 20, 25. That's where 20, that's where we can sell around. Maybe too, 20, 30 percent if it's like possibly if it's like gangster prime time. Yeah. Prime time area. Yep. But try to get it in at 10, 15 percent. And if it's in a really, really amazing area, you could probably try to contract it at 20. See, the amazing thing about humans, right, is there's certain spots on Earth that are more popular than others, whether it be just the view, whether it be the utilities, whether it be the resources, the whatever ocean, it is. The ocean air of Ventura. Sure. But not Ventura. I, I, where, um, what? What's it called? Where? Your Venice. 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 Yeah. No, I mean, but. So you've got all these neighborhoods that people want to live in, and then they just bulldoze the houses. They do. They just and then they build a new house. That's it. That's you know it. what I mean? So, popular areas get more, get more money. There you go. <laughs> you know. You know. Here, you know. What we should do on the on the um, pipeline of shows is we should have somebody come in here that knows about zoning. Sure. And um, I have a couple of people that, um, at the zoning department in Phoenix that mm -hmm. I've become friends with. I wonder mm. if they'd come in and talk about zoning and and the process of changing because I'm sure mm. you run into land opportunities. You're like, oh damn, it's zoned improperly. Mm -hmm. I've done it before. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. It's mm -hmm. expensive too. You got to get surveys. You got to get engineers. You got to do reports. You got to do soil studies. You got to do 
all of this engineering, then you apply for a zoning change. You got to show them what you're trying to do. They want to see it because all the neighborhood is going to say, I don't want it because of this, 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 and this. Yep. Very expensive. That's right. Okay, here's a here's a question, Jamil. This one's for you, brother. How do I find the ARV in my area? I am in Northwest Arkansas. Well, you want to find houses in whatever subject area you're looking for that have sold recently in a renovated state. That'll give you the after repair value. Okay, so what's important in what I just said is they've got to be in renovated state. So if you're looking at houses and they're kind of you know, they're still in original condition. That's not a comp. That's not ARV. That's not after repair value. You want to find where things are selling once they've been fixed up. Now, you might not find houses in areas that have been fixed up. Then what you want to do is you want to find where are houses trading at for cash value in yeah. that area. Okay. And you can find information like this on tools like Batch Leads or PropStream, whatever it is that you're interested in using. And that's where you can find cash buyer data, or you can find what houses have sold for in a renovated state on websites like Zillow or Batch Leads as well. So that's how you find the ARV in your area. Remember though, if you're hmm. talking about a subject house, you wanna only compare it with houses that are similar to it. So you cannot break certain appraisal rules. If you're looking for the appraisal rules on how to actually comp a house, you can get that on my IG. Just send me a DM and we'll send you my appraisal rules that'll teach you all about comping. I even got a pretty good video on YouTube you can watch that and learn all about it. Awesome. What's going on with Arizona? 2747 or what is it? Well, the Where now you have to put on the contract that uh, that there's a wholesaler, that you're a wholesaler, right? I, I haven't I haven't seen it. Yeah. It's been no, passed. No, it's been passed. It's been, right? it's been passed. Yeah. So It's been passed. When does it go in, in, it, into action? Two weeks ago. Yeah. So the contracts that we're working on right now still don't have it, but they're older. We, cha we right? changed ours uh, two, 10 days ago. We just barely changed ours. I so what does it mean? Because I feel like this is probably going to be the most common response that states have for wholesaling real estate. I think it's the beginning of – it's foreplay, right? It's Arizona, and it's people that we actually know. Uh, Doug – I'll say his name because this has not been something he's tried to keep private – but Doug Hopkins is a really, really well-known wholesaler here locally. Yep. And he's like, I'm going to, he's like, there's just so many wholesalers that are hanging sellers out to dry, just doing improper business, locking up houses with no intention of closing. They have no, like, they don't even have $10 for earnest money, stuff like that. And he's like, I want to make it at least known. And so him and like, a, I don't know, 10 or 15 people lobbied and put mm -hmm. a lot of money into making this happen. He's a wholesaler. Mm -hmm. And he was like 1% of the reason why this happened. Right. I think that states that are like, you know what, we're not full, we're not ready for like full blown regulation like Illinois and other places. I think this is the beginning of maybe a five year journey to ultimately regulate wholesaling here in Arizona. What's the language? Uh, the language is that you have to state that you are a whole, you have to state literally that you are a wholesaler of real estate or that you intend to wholesale. Um, and that if you, not, mm -hmm. what happens? Um, I can't remember. Uh, they can back out. The seller can oh, back yeah, yeah. out with no, it, it is, it is not a, it is a voidable contract. If you do not disclose that you have any intentions to wholesale. Yeah. So my, uh, so Sean St. Clair, yeah, attorney that's been on the show, we yeah. should get him on yeah. here. Yeah. And even if he just comes on here for 20, 30 minutes, you know, have you seen the title companies start to enforce it? Not yet. No, not all the, not all the title companies even know about it. Right. But I would say in the next 12 months, everybody's going to know about it. Yep. And even the real estate agents are going to get educated on it in their continued education mm -hmm. classes. Title companies are going to get it in their continued education classes. It's going to take 12 months to ultimately educate the whole state, but it will be um, enforced. And then what's going to happen is now you're going to have title companies looking at the contracts when they first come in and actually looking, did you disclose this? Is this a, a valid contract? Because they're not going to be able to ratified they won't be able to do anything they won't get title check this out you won't be able to get title insurance so mm -hmm. i own a title company you won't be able to get title insurance as the end buyer right mm -hmm. if the wholesaler who sold it to you did not disclose. disclose yep and so that's a challenge right because what could happen is the seller could go i was not told even though the end buyer closes and let's say that the title company doesn't know about this they give title insurance mm -hmm. The seller comes back a year later, two years later, and goes, I was never actually told that this was wholesale. And I just looked it up online. It was never disclosed to me. Now they have a they have grounds for a lawsuit. Yeah. And guess who has to pay for that lawsuit? 
the title company who issue, issued insurance against that transaction. So you're going to see a lot of title companies start enforcing that. Are you going to see it. a lot of are you going to see a lot of wholesalers mess up their contracts and and buyers backing out? Well, I hope I hope that we educate people and tell people, hey, That's here's it. the contract, yeah. and we just give that we update all of our contracts and we let people know. The question that I had for Sean uh, St. Clair was, do you have to verbally say it, right? Because um, that's something in my contract right now that I, I I gave to both of you guys that we had Sean write the memorandum language in there, mm -hmm. is that you actually don't have to walk through the full contract with the, with the seller. They can read it on their own accord. Um, so I'm just wondering, do I have to say, hey, I'm a wholesaler? Kind of like a real estate agent has to say, hey, I just want to let you know I am a licensed real estate agent. I'm not going to represent you, but I am a licensed real estate agent. They have to disclose that. So do I have to verbally say it to a seller or is it okay oh. for it to just be on the contract? We'll talk to I an think attorney. It just, I think it just needs to be in the contract. Hashtag not an attorney. Yep. Yeah. 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 I would imagine we'll it just it needs to be in the contract. Yeah, it's going to be disclosed. Yep. yep. That'll be, that'd be a good like, 15-minute segment. But I think that's going to be the easiest plug-in for other states to do as yeah. opposed to, hey, let's get everybody licensed. Yeah. Um, this is so if states do not have this law, will a title company who is nationwide still require me including this in language? No, because it's state by state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every title company, even if they're nationwide, like um, what's a big one? Fidelity. Fidelity. They're the biggest. There you go. Fidelity. They're individually licensed in every state. So they're basing their title insurance on state laws, not on national laws. Right. right? And if they did that, oh, my gosh, that'd be a nightmare for them. They have to individually manage per state. Um, well, this is just knocking down anybody that's going out there, locking up properties at any price, mm -hmm. putting a memorandum on them and saying, hey, give me five grand or you can't sell it's your property. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's great news. I, I, I it enjoy it. It is awesome. I love it. I mean, there's a handful yeah. of people here in Phoenix that have really bad names. Um, some of them, most of them are not in business anymore. At no. least you don't hear about them because they got ran out of town or people just don't want to do business with them. Is They would go lock up sellers and contracts at crazy prices mm -hmm. and no earnest money. Mm -mm. No, no cure notice. No, mm -hmm. like their contracts were so one sided, and they'd have they would ghost the seller and sit on it and file a memorandum on the property. And then you go, Bro, this is not a valid contract and it's not a valid memorandum. Great, sue me. Okay, well, a lawsuit against that person is going to cost seven to twelve thousand bucks. So the play with them was always cut me a five thousand dollar check and I'll walk away. That's it. So all they had to do was go lock up 20. It's, it's like blackmail. It's it blackmail, blackmail, right? It's blackmail. Or, it's blackmail. Bribery or something. So P, that's that's the thing I struggle Extortion. with. Extortion. Is that's that like one. new wholesalers yeah. think that when I make comments like that, where I go, man, these knucklehead wholesalers do X, Y, and Z with the contracts. New wholesalers don't get demoralized by this. No, do it ethically. Do it right. Do it ethically. I mean, we're yeah. not talking about you. We're talking about people who know better that have been in the business 10 years, but are using the law in their advantage to take advantage of sellers. So by no means are we talking to people that are brand new starting out. We don't want to make this hard for you. Just do what you're supposed to do and you'll make a ton of freaking money. Yep. Can we put uh, up a little bit, Joel? Joel. Jo hey. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So what are some things when cold calling to lead the seller down the funnel into the offer for the next call? Mm. What are some things we have to lead them to close and sign? First of all, remember, Joel, there's a process here. All right. You need to Joel, Joel. All right. Joel. Yeah, that makes sense. Joel, you need to pre-qualify. This is the primal right? Eskimo, just so you know. Yeah, I know. Condition, timeline, motivation, price. Condition, timeline, motivation, price. Remember how important timeline is because this is going to really help you let you know if they've made the decision to sell. So first of all, they have to already have made the decision to sell. You have to pre-qualify them. Once you've got that going on, now you have an understanding of what their expectations are. Pull the price out of the seller. Listen, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, every single person I've worked with has a magic number. And when they get that number, they're ready to sign an agreement. What is your magic number? Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you've lived here so long. You've seen every, all your neighbors sell. This is incredible. Uh, you've seen probably what they sold for. What, what are you hoping to get for your property? What would you take for this property? Pull the price out of them so that you have an expectation. And then get upfront agreements, advanced agreements. If when I come over on the appointment and you agree with the price in terms, is there anything stopping us from moving forward and opening up escrow with the title company? Right. That's a broad, quick version of it, but that's the basics of it. You have to pre-qualify to see if they've actually made the decision to sell. 
yeah. then from there, condition, timeline, motivation. I, have, I, I love all that. It's really, really good. I had a, um, you know, I'm a TTP student. So mm -hmm. I follow a lot of what Brent says and, um, you know, put some of my own flavor and it's like, I learned how to cook steak from Brent, but then I added my own little bit of Cajun sauce on it. That's right. It. So, um, one of the things I said to this morning, somebody DMS me, I get a lot of deals in my DM. So somebody DMS me and goes, man, I got a deal. Seller's ready to sign. Okay. Then why haven't you signed? Um, well, I don't know. I've been waiting for a buyer. Perfect. Okay, great. Let's get on the phone. So I was on the phone with them for 40 minutes. I'm like, wow, like why haven't you signed? All right. So you are, you see a cute girl, you want to ask her on a date. You just don't know what to ask her, right? You don't know how to close the deal, right? So this is what I told him to say. I also set up a lot of my stuff. If I get turned down, I want to be able to set up for future follow-up. So I said to him, I go, here's what you want to do. Um, I call the seller. This is the script to say, Hey, um, my partners and I had a conversation about the, the house yesterday. We've got four other houses we've got to make a decision on this week. Mm -hmm. um, if I had to go back and tell my partners how serious you are that we need to turn down two of the other opportunities mm -hmm. and deploy our capital with you, how close are we to getting a contract? Love it. And Love he, it. Com he comes back, he goes, oh my gosh, is it that easy? Go, yeah. Because you made you made it sound like you got other opportunities. You have to turn something down to come and deploy your capital with them or spend money on their house. Sends me a text message this morning or about, I don't know, an hour or two ago. It worked. I got a contract. <laughs> so um, I really like your language. Um, but my thing was partners. Like, hey, if I go back to my partners, what should I say in regards to how serious you are about right. selling your house this week? Yep. Or should I just follow up with you in a couple of weeks? Um, a follow-up thing that I like to do, I always like to set up our long-term follow-up. And I say, look, we have a lender. We don't buy everything with cash. We use loans and all that kind of stuff as most people do. Um, my lender only lets us buy one to two houses per week. And so we have to make a determination out of the 10 houses we might be looking at, who do we follow up with long-term and who's ready this week? So if I was going to allocate this capital for my lender to you, would this be a week you'd be ready to move forward? Or should we just follow up in a couple of weeks? Great. And they'll go, oh, no, no, I, I'm ready. Let's just figure out a number. Perfect. A timeline, 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 yeah. timeline. Because there is a moment, I feel like, where you can give your number way too early, and these sellers are incredibly savvy. Right. And it's mm -hmm. why my number one um, shirt that I have, I'm where, I'll be wearing it at Clever Summit, by the way, is buyers are liars, sellers are worse. Right there. Um, oh, is it? Yeah, somebody put it on there. Oh, they said sell it buyers. That's great. Oh, there it is. Boom. Uh, Fizbos are the worst level. Okay, no, so it's up, it's up top. So buyers yeah. are liars, sellers are worse. So sellers, the nicest people, hmm. Granny Smith, will be like, you're the only person I'm talking to. Meanwhile, you haven't gotten timeline out like Brent just coached you on, yeah. and you go give your number to them way too early. Grandma Smith, who is the sweetest lady in the world, what is she going to do, Jamil? If you gave her your number too early, she's she's gonna she's 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 gonna know. If you give her your number too early, she's she's gonna want the sky. She's gonna want the sky. She's gonna be like, uh, okay, great, I'll think about it. Yeah, call or, the other seven people. Uh -huh. Um, I already got an offer at one seventy nine, she but she's the baseline. Yeah, she knows. She now has an offer from you. She's now anchor. She now is gonna use you to anchor everybody else because you didn't strip out the timeline properly. And you're giving it way too Let early. Let me ask you this. This is interesting. And this kind of piggybacks on what we were just talking about. I'm going to jump tracks back to it. Um, what do you say to the homeowner, right? That they're like, this person is going to give me $40,000 more, $50,000 more, whatever it is. And you know, you kind of get an idea of who it is. You mm -hmm. know what the reputation is in the industry. You know that they, they lock they up properties and then they wait 48 hours, 72 hours before, and they just beat them up and beat them up and beat them up. How do you go in there without sounding like a little bitch being like, oh, well, their reputation's terrible. You know what uh, I mean? Yeah, I just you did this Saturday. That's how I got the contract on Saturday. Yeah. Same exact thing. So uh, lady, she's older, right? Same story I told you guys earlier. I go, well, here's the thing. I've been in business a long time. I own multiple properties around town. Here's my offer. Mm -hmm. My offer is $1,000 more than any other offer you ever receive. Right. In fact, you should go shop it. Yep. However, I have a couple of contingencies. I have a couple of requirements in order for that to happen. And they're already Now they're already like, wait, what? $1,000 more? Mm -hmm. I go, as long as they have a written offer, they have 
non-refundable earnest money and they state they will not wholesale the property. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this is nobody wants to hear me say this, but you're you ask me the question, I'm telling you the honest answer. Yeah. I basically put them in a situation where they have to double close. Mm -hmm. That's how I compete. If you're yeah. going to be crazy and you're going to throw out crazy numbers, now you're going to freaking wake the dragon. Mm -hmm. And the dragon's going to come at you and go non-refundable earnest money. No inspection. No inspection. Yeah. Um, and you also so you're going to commit to buying the deal. You have to commit to double closing the deal. Uh, how about, how about not only will I give you non-refundable earnest money, I'll have it released tomorrow to you in Ooh, your bank account. Yeah. 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 Do they want that 10 grand right now? A lot of them do. Yeah, they do. Cause they're, they're, they might be moving. They might be paying for things. The lady that I bought the house from on Saturday, she's like, I'm paying $200 a month just to feed the cats that are still here. So I'm, you know, when you talk about non cats, the, her, her, her daughter who had passed away. Got it. So, um, but when somebody's crazy about their number, I go, no problem. And what's great is I don't actually have to give a number away. Right. I just say, I'll give you a thousand dollars more. Now, there's a whole bunch of questions that come about this and they go, well, what if the other people are willing to do it? What if the other people are doing this, this, and this? Great. They deserve the deal. You don't. Okay. If they're, if they're willing to pay 40 grand over, they deserve the deal, mm -hmm. but you're essentially, we're playing poker here, right? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to stack the deck in my favor. So for me, if somebody's offering $40,000 over what I'm willing to go, look, I did this to Cody Sperber. I felt really bad. <laughs> so check this out. It was Brian Apples. Mm -hmm. I go to an appointment mm -hmm. and it's one of their acquisition guys fighting me with me on the deal. And I'm there in person. This is probably two years ago. And I tell the lady, same thing. I go, look, I, I'll not only will I match any offer you get, mm -hmm. but I'll beat them by a thousand dollars, no matter what the number is. As long as they're willing to put it in writing on an actual agreement, non-refundable earnest. Mm -hmm. Okay. That means if they cancel on you, they lose their earnest money and they're going to close in their own name. So she's, I'm standing there with her and I go, just text the guy right now. So I, she goes, why, what did you say? I go, just give me the phone. So I grabbed the phone <laughs> and I'm, te I'm texting Cody Sperber's acquisition guy. Um, hey, this is uh, Margaret or whatever her name was. And I'm texting the whole entire thing out. Boom, sends it to her. And I go, here's what's going to happen. He's not even going to reply to you. Mm -hmm. So if he doesn't reply to you in the next 15 minutes, what do we want to do? And she's like, I, I guess I'll just sell it to you. There you go. So I buy it. Who did I sell that deal to? I sold that deal to Cody Sperber for forty thousand dollars above what I paid for oh, it. You didn't. I did. Oh no! A and and he and they let me and they let me do the construction on the deal. So I made <laughs> I, I made money on the. It was probably three years ago when I still had a construction crew. We were doing work for people. So I got the deal because his acquisition guy was not approved. His acquisition guy was not approved to make that deal. To make that deal, right? So he had to. He, Pace knew he had to go get permission, and in the time that he had to go get permission, Pace yanked it yep yeah i just i what i say and here's here's the funny thing about it i have a copy of this contract did my contract have a non-refundable earnest in it and did my contract say i wasn't going to uh, wholesale it no it did not no i just said i just told them if they're willing to do this i will pay a thousand dollars more by no means did i say i was going to do any of those things by the way when you run across really great deals and somebody wants all those things and it's a smoking deal. Mm -hmm. You better find a yeah. way to give them those buy things. It. Yeah, buy it. Buy because it. it's a no brain. I've done it a ton of times and it is just beautiful. I mean, some of the biggest deals. Great. I'll close it. Great. I'll find the 10K earnings. This is even when I didn't have funds to be able to do it and close it on myself. I, they threw anything at me and I was going to be like, yep, no problem. And then I get on the phone. I never, hey, gave, I never hey. gave credit to Jamil for this, but it was like in my first year of selling deals to Jamil, I go, I got this deal at this price. And Jamil's like, bro, get that contract right mm -hmm. now. I was like, well, they want this, this, this. He's like, give it to them. Do it. I was like, wait, <sighs> I, I can do that? Yes, yeah. give it to them. Whatever it is, we'll close on it. We'll, I'm like, oh my gosh, I just I just uncovered Thanos' glove. Mm -hmm. I now have all the power. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you got to be able to commit to deals, guys. That's why you need a leverage partner. That's why you need to be in business with buyers, actual buyers. Actual buyers, you have to be able to close on these houses. Well, it's an important lesson that you're saying is that I didn't have the ability to give those things at the time, but did I not because I had you as a partner? Right. Well, you had two words, squat up. Squat mm -hmm. up, baby. That's it. Squat up. That's what we're talking about. In this business, you're growing your real estate wholesaling business. You need to, one, have somebody that has the capital, okay? Mm -hmm. Two, find somebody in your in your market that that you can 
um, that you can meet with and connect with and that are doing amazing things and are doing more than you surround yourself, start meetup groups, start whatever, start just get in front of people that have a passion for this business and have the capital to be able to close on deals and you win. These guys have been touring the world saying squat up for <laughs> two and a half years, you know, you what know I, three years, maybe what I really liked about my relationship with Jamil in the very beginning, um, was something very specific that I didn't think I realized until years later is that I would continually be hit up by Jamil or somebody on his team. Where's the next deal? Where's the next deal? Mm -hmm. Where's the next deal? Mm -hmm. Where's the next deal? What do you need help with? What an accountability partner I had with Keegley right. and Jamil and, and, and like hounding me and reminding me I need to get out and work. Like I had a customer, right? It's like I have a t-shirt shop and my customer stops by every day and goes, you got any blue shirts? No, I don't have any blue shirts. Okay, I'll be back tomorrow. They come back tomorrow. Why the hell do I not have blue shirts? My customer keeps asking me for blue shirts. Mm -hmm. So having a buyer and somebody on your back end, like a Jamil, Keegley, um, you know, Brent's done a ton of deals for me as well. Guys, it, it's an accountability thing above anything else. Well, and it's huge. I mean, there there is certain, when you're doing your first kind of handful of deals, there's a lot of apprehension. There's a lot of nervousness. Is this going to get closed? Right. Because you don't get any income if it doesn't close. Right. And I remember working with some other wholesalers in town that would push even blasting out their deals to like two days before turned into a nightmare. And I remember doing the first deal with you and I think it closed like two days early Yeah, and I'm like getting a check and I was like, Oh was my gosh, yes. you know what I mean? It was yes. just absolutely incredible. So yes. Yep. It's just, you, you got to find the people in your market. There's it's everywhere. It is absolutely everywhere. Just find the people that have, Miss Archie, find the people that have the private money. They're 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 in meetup groups. Every go to meetup.com. They're in all of those. Join all of the local Facebook groups. Join all of that stuff. Go on bigger pockets. They've got bigger pockets meetups the forums all in over there, the time. Guys, incredible. Squat up they're, with people in here. Right here. Yep. Go to the networking event. Who's not going to the virtual? If you're here's what I I dude. If you're going to the Clever Summit. In person, great, amazing, yep. good for you. We'll see you there. If you don't have somebody on your team going to it virtually so that they're mm. in the comments, mining the comments oh, for all the genius. deals in there, then you've missed the point. Mm -hmm. You need to be going physically and virtually. Does Emily have a, a, a link for virtual tickets? I don't know. Emily, if you're there, put that put, put the link up. She's always there. That's a that's a genius move. You have to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You got to attend physically and virtually because virtually, there's actually business in that chat. Well, so you and I, you and I were on the 10x stage a couple of weeks ago. Yes. And we go behind and we're on the virtual stage with Pete Vargas. And I'm looking at all the Zoom comments and there's one guy in there going, "Hey guys, let's do deals together. Let's do." De that's bro. It's like free business sitting in the comments mm -hmm. every time how mm -hmm. many hundreds of thousands of dollars have been made in the comments of wholesale hotline mm -hmm. um i can look at names in here i mean in like look at ingrid medium wave dave there's th these guys get hundreds deals. of thousands of dollars in the comments of this of this podcast guys incredible so, so I, wait, what's the podcast numbers how many downloads last 30 days Guys, this uh, Wholesale Hotline is also a podcast. Yes, mm -hmm. it's this show, but the rest of the week, that's only one day. The rest of the week is um, is all the content that Pace, Jamil, and I, uh, and it's all curated by Aaron here and made to be really, really, really like you need to go on an appointment. You're, you want to know how to pre-qualify. You want to know who to sell your deal to. You can pick and choose all the podcasts to listen to. They're absolutely bananas. Hundred and three thousand downloads and 130 listens. Or 103. 103. It's I think it's Last about I think days. it's about a hundred thousand after we take your mom out of out of the out of the account. <laughs> Just bringing her back. Huh? Tell, yeah, tell your mom to stop downloading the podcast three thousand times a week. Okay. <laughs> your, mom. your mom. She loves it. She loves it. <laughs> damn, Wee. son. Damn, damn, damn. That's awesome. Um, okay, so I watched this YouTube video probably four years ago. British guy, yeah, well-known real estate inv investor in England. Yeah, he goes, "Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into the comments on like these live shows and YouTube and stuff like that." Can you do it in his accent? I, I no, I, I can't. Ah. You could, you definitely could. 
So he starts going in there. People recognize him, right? He was like, I'm going to show you guys how much money I can make as a real estate investor getting in other people's lives. Literally, that's the only way I'm going to get deals. Yeah. So he gets in there and people are like, oh, I, I recognize you. And then all of a sudden people are like, well, of course you can do it. Like everybody knows you. What? <laughs> so he go, he just changes his name, gets a, a fake thing on like iStock photo or whatever. Sure. And he starts making money in the comments. Mm -hmm. And then he does a whole YouTube video about like, how look how much money I made in all the comments. Mm -hmm. So somebody goes, yeah, but you got, you, you, um, I don't go in the comments. I don't go on live. He's like, fine, I'll go to a RIA. Mm -hmm. They have these in England too. Yeah. So he goes to a RIA. People recognize him. So he gets like, he changes his hair, changes his face, whatever. Like he's a well-known guy. It'd be like Grant Cardone going to a Rio. Okay, got it. Right? It's yeah. like that big of a guy. Yeah. So he goes in there and he goes, all right, I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to get a deal every time I go to a Rio. I'm going to get a deal or a private money lender and I'm going to disguise myself as somebody else. And he goes through, I'll give you guys the link. It's the one of the most- That's amazing. This dude's amazing. And I'm looking- That's the next stage. I'm looking at 600 <laughs> people in the YouTube comments and a, you know 75 yeah. people over here on Instagram. Um. And I'm, I'm thinking, how much money would Jamil or Brent mm -hmm. or Pace make if literally all we were doing was in the comments squatting up with people? Yeah. Could you make 20 grand a week? Yeah. Easily. Could you make 40 grand a week? Easily. Could you make 100 grand a week? Easily. He paused for a second. Just a moment you paused. Do you think you could make 100? Easily. Okay. He didn't pause that time. He's confident. Carly says, I would like to see this. Mm -hmm. The only person stopping you from doing it, Carly, is you. That's it. Okay. I see a lot of people that are coming in here. They don't even listen to what we have to say. They come in here because they know squatting up and coming into wholesale hotline. So yes, just who's got deals? Yeah, I'd say who needs help, right? I would start out with me. I would say, depending on what I have to offer, mm -hmm. I, if I have nothing to offer, I would nothing. say, who can I drive for deals for? Yeah. Who wants to call leads if I go find ugly houses? Yeah. Right. There's a thousand different ways that you guys can match up on whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you've got people in here that you go, okay, Tyler Townsley, he's great at talking to sellers. You've got Dario who just got his first $50,000 deal um, from Ingrid, right? Ingrid who can close deals and knows creative structures. You've got TTP students in here. You got Astro mm -hmm. students have massive buyers list. Guys, find out what each other are, are good at. And mm -hmm. if nobody's good at anything, say, okay, well, what can I offer you? My time, my energy. One of my favorite things you ever did, Brent, was Super Saturdays. Mm -hmm. Getting together. That's it. Go to a Starbucks. Yep. Go to somebody's house. Yep. Make calls. Or when somebody has a question in the comments that goes, how do I find ARV? You don't even have to yeah. meet up. You could do a Google yep. Meet. Google Meet up. Yeah. You could go live with your cameras that you all have on your computers or find somebody that has a computer and get on a dialer and make calls with people around the country, celebrate when people are getting leads. I mean, that's what it's about. I'm going to retire from Wholesale Hotline and I'm just going to sit in the comments. This is bullshit. I'm, <laughs> you, you guys are sitting in here not even realizing how much freaking money, when you really think yeah. about it, yeah. how much money I mean, is sitting in there? I'll, I'll be honest with you. I make a lot of money in the comments. People come to Keegley and do deals with us all the time. Yep. I, I, the yep. reason why I said easily is because we're doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm only buying maybe two deals a month from people in Wholesale Hotline. So you guys need to step it up. Step it up. All right. My gosh. Awesome. awesome. Next week. Next week's episode. Where, where are people uh, seeing you this weekend? Guys, I'm I'm retiring this week for one week and one week only. <laughs> I'm retiring. Um, we are going to focus entirely on Clever Summit this week. Jamil and I have a massive amount of Astro and Sub2 students coming out to the summit. It is absolutely going to be bananas. bananas. It'll be it'll be bananas. <laughs> absolutely bananas. I'm very excited about that. Looking forward to, to sharing the stage again uh, with my brother Jamil. And um, there's a lot out. of people there. Two thousand two hundred. No, people I mean physically. The, the speakers. I mean, you got Kiyosaki, right? Yeah. Yep. Who's who's that? Robert Kiyosaki. I don't know who. I never yeah. heard that before. <laughs> Did he write a book or something? I think so. I think he wrote uh, this book here. The most popular book of all time? At least in our in our world, yep. Robert Kiyosaki is the keynote speaker. Yep. Um, Some guy named Ed. Ed Milet is coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ed Milet. Oh. Ed Milet is coming. So Jamil's going to be hanging out with those guys and partying. So there's parties. My wife's birthday is on Friday. Um, there's a nightclub thing, whatever else. Even though I'm not a nightclub person, I think I'm going to – have a, a good time and just watch Let's everybody go. else. You're gonna night the club, bro. I'm, yeah. I'm going. I'm going. I'll, guys, I'll be gone by eight thirty. 
clubs don't open at eight. What time do they open? You're gonna we're gonna get there one. at ten, and you're gonna stay until no. You're gonna get there at one, and we're gonna stay until five. Okay, I'm down. I'm there down. There you go. I'm I'm 100 percent down. So we're gonna be there this he, week. He wakes up at two thirty Thursday. For uh, so we get there Thursday. We'll be there Friday. Uh, Jamil is gonna make his first appearance on Bradley's dropping bombs on Saturday. Nice, absolutely epic. So that's gonna be cool in Vegas. And then on Saturday night, we were invited to a private party with Ryan Pineda at his house. You know that's gonna be dope. That's gonna be dope. So um, that I ain't doing anything but that, focusing on that entirely. Uh, Brent Daniels, what do you got this week? Disneyland. Really? Yeah. Wow. Disneyland That's or why Disney, I'm not going with you Or guys. Disney World. Like, it was like, because uh, Cody was like, yeah, come speak. And I'll be like, yeah, I love it. Vegas is no problem. That's easy. Right, right. And uh, ended up being on the only week that we had booked. Uh, so, yeah, going to Disneyland with Bo for the first time. Wow. Five-year-old. It's going to be magical. So, yeah. Honestly, I would trade that I would trade what I'm doing well, all day wait, long. Can I just say what has been displayed for you gentlemen and ladies is balance. Yeah. Yeah. Do it all sure. guys. Love your family. Do your things. Work hard. Run the world. Get it. Get it. Love you guys. We'll see you next week. Skid it. Or just say squat up. So squat up and enjoy the show. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One, two, three. So, so squat, squat up and enjoy the show. What are you doing? I didn't say that thing. Why? I don't know. <laughs> okay. So squat up and enjoy the show. Cool. I think we should use the one where Jamil doesn't say anything. <laughs>